Hello and welcome to our Bible study for June 19th, 2022. Uh, and we're continuing by our series looking at each century of Christian history uh, by looking at the question of the 6th century, uh, what does it mean to be holy? Uh, and to start off with, we're, we're looking at, it's a, it's a newer hymn, but um, a hymn that uh, deals with uh, the, th the themes we're t going with today. All for Christ I have forsaken, and have taken up my cross. Worldly joy, its fame and fortune, now I count as worthless dross. Who is sweeter than Christ Jesus? No good thing in him I lack. Hand to plow at peace I follow. Where he leads me, why look back? Gone the past, unknown the future. Grace supplies my daily breath. Strong in Christ through death's dark valley. Firm and faithful unto death. When God takes me home to heaven, should this be the day I die, God will keep my spouse and children as the apple of his eye. Though the road ahead be thorny, though dark clouds all light obscure, though my cross-shaped path grows steeper with the Lord, I am secure. All right, and so our um, the th question again for this week is, what does it mean to be holy? Um, and really what this is getting at is um, dealing with um, with the monastic movements, dealing with people who are deciding to separate themselves from society. We've talked, we've heard the last few weeks about how Christianity went from being a persecuted religion to at least tolerated, if not uh, the state religion, um, and all the different um, opportunities and challenges that came with that, especially in terms of lots of the doctrinal formulations, um, in terms of how how the Trinity works, how Jesus' two natures work. Um, and But of course, those weren't only theological decisions, but there were, there were political ramifications as the emperors were trying to use this to unify uh, the, the Roman Empire uh, more. And so, of course, dealing with all of this, th that infighting, all of that political stuff, now that it was an accepted thing, um, the people were trying to figure out then ways to... Um, to live out their Christian life in different ways, um, and so and one so one of the ways that they they do it in trying to be holy is um, through the, through these different monastic things, and that's what we'll be talking about today. Looking, but looking at some different ways that they different people, different ways that they organize themselves, different ways that they separated themselves from the world, um, and things like that. Uh, so, but to start off, a few definitions we need to go over. Um, so monasticism uh, is the quest for union with God through prayer, penance, deprivation, and separation from the world. Uh, and, th and that kind of goes along with um, the de one, one of the definitions of holy is separate, set apart. Um, and so these are people who are trying to set themselves apart from the world. Uh, that even though now the church is, you know, Christianity and the church is more official is when the, within the bounds of the Roman Empire, um, that uh, they still think they need to be set apart uh, from the world. Uh, so, and of course, a monk or a monastic is someone who practices that, someone who's separating themselves from the world, someone who's trying to step away from society to pray, uh, to do penance, uh, and often to deprive themselves of some of the cultural trapping, some of the accoutrements that, um, that others would have. Um, an ascetic is someone who abstains from the desires of the flesh. And so this, as we go through, these are be, you know, the, the ones who um, tr live, live simple lives and, and try and, avo and avoid things uh, of the world in order to be holy. Um, an eremitical is a monk who lives alone. Uh, that's from the Greek word for desert. And so we'll look at some monks who try, who live alone, or at least try to live alone, um, out in the desert. Um, an anchorite is a monk who lives away from society, um, so not necessarily alone, but they're away from society. Um, and some of this definition will change; the definitions change over the centuries too. But in the time period we're dealing with, that's what that is. Uh, Kohenobitic is a monk who lives in a monastic community. So some people lived by themselves. In, in attempts to be holy, and others decided that they wanted to live together in community with others who were seeking to do the same things. Uh, and then an abbot is a leader of a monastery. Um, so uh, 
not not with Costello, the other kind of abbots. Um, and then a Lavra or Laura is a settlement of monks living in semi-individual cells. All right, so what does it mean to be holy? Well, um, we find a few spots in the Bible where where we well, that gets talked about. Um, so in Leviticus, as God's talking to his, giving his people the commands of what they should do as they're on, their, on the Exodus, he says, you shall be holy to me, for I, the Lord, am holy, that have separated you from the people so that you should be mine. And so, again, one of the themes of being holy is, to be, is being set apart and being separate from the world. Um, that's part of why the Israelites had to do all these things that seemed weird to the surrounding cultures. So they, um, you know, circumcision will be an example of that, the, the kosher, keeping kosher, the dietary rules were, were uh, some of that. Some of the other practices they had uh, made sure that they were different than the surrounding people. Uh, they were set apart. Um, they were separate and so that there wouldn't be that temptation to try and mix with the other peoples and then we end up following their gods and culture too. Of course, didn't always work, but that was at least one of the goals behind that. Uh, or if we look at Psalm 24, uh, who shall ascend the hill of the Lord and who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully, he will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. All right, again, you know, holy, you're set apart, uh, so you have clean hands, a pure heart, you're not swearing deceitfully, you're not lifting up your soul to idols, to anything that's false. And then you you can be in the holy place of God, the set apart, separate place of God. Uh, so again, yeah, holy is separate, and so what we're dealing with here is the fact, um, again, that now that Christianity has become a part of the culture, uh, is at least tolerated, if not held up as a state religion, then people are finding it challenging in different ways to live out their Christian life as opposed to when Christianity was forbidden, when it was persecuted, things like that. All right, and we can kind of see the those two threads um, present. Uh, Jesus is talking uh, with the crowd after you know, hearing that John the Baptist has been arrested and, and his disciples get sent away. And, and Jesus says, for John the Baptist, came neither eating or drinking, and they said he has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, look at him, a glutton, a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Uh, so, you know, both John the Baptist and Jesus were living out their, uh, what they thought of their Christian lives in, in different ways. Um, and that John was, you know, eating locusts and wild honey, wearing camel hair stuff out in the desert, living alone. And so people thought, said, he has a demon. But now Jesus is traveling around. He's eating with all these, with tax collectors and sinners. He's visiting the towns. And so then they call him a glutton and a drunkard. Um, so again, you, no matter how you're trying to live out your Christian life, people are going to um, li or live, live out your life following God. Uh, people are going to find, tr have trouble dealing with that. And, they're gonna, and you're, you're not going to please everyone doing that. Uh, we also see that too, um, you know, when the young man comes to Jesus, it says, "Teacher, what mu good deed must I do to have eternal life?" It said, "Why do you ask me about what is good? There's only one who is good. If you enter life, keep the commandments." Uh, the young the man said to Jesus, "Which ones?" Jesus said, "You shall not murder. Commit not shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother, and love your neighbor. You shall love your neighbor as yourself." The young man said to him, All these I have kept, what do I still lack? And Jesus said to him, If you would be perfect, go, sell what you possess, give to the poor, then you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And so this is, again, a man who thinks he's following, following the law, he's living in society, he's doing, follow, following, being a good follower of God. Uh, and Jesus, but he doesn't feel like he's doing enough. And so Jesus tells him what he needs to do. Uh, but the man, young man goes away sorrowful, and we're never told in, in Scripture what actually happens to him. Uh, but we do, what we do learn is that this, this story, this passage, this, this encounter with Jesus inspires others. Um, and so one of the first uh, monks uh, that we find in the Christian traditions, or kind of the first famous monk there, um, in, in Christian tradition, is a guy named Anthony of Egypt 
who came from a wealthy family but renounced all of that because of reading this passage, because of hearing Jesus tell the young man, go sell all that you have and give to the poor. Um, so he lives uh, he, before the time period we're studying. Um, he was from about 251 to 356 AD. Uh, again, not the first monk, but uh, one of the most well-known, and he especially popularized that idea of going out into the wilderness uh, to be a monk. Um, and so, uh, again, seems to live 100 years, so apparently the living out in the desert doesn't hurt him that much. Um, all right, and so... Uh, and so here you kind of see um, Egypt, and again, the, the, the culture, the, the ge ge geography that uh, these monks are in is going to play a part in how they're able to live out their lives. Um, and so, of course, in Egypt, um, life is around the rivers. Uh, it's, everything's based on the, on the River Nile. The, uh, it floods and recedes. Um, and that create, as it recedes, it leaves behind the silt and creates good, good soil. Um, it's the main source of water. Um, so Egyptians for centuries have just generally lived along the river. Um, so that means there's, but there you can see Egypt's a lot bigger than that, than just that little narrow band around the Nile. And so there's plenty of room for people if you know where to find water in other ways um, to be able to go out and do stuff. And so uh, Anthony seems to be one, seems to have been out here. He, he travels to a few different spots because um, he tries to live, live out his, li his monastic life alone and people keep coming and following him and trying to learn from him. Um, and depending on how he is, he, he occasionally gets annoyed that he can't be alone because all these people are following him, wanting to learn from him. Um, but he also then popularizes this idea of going out into the desert uh, as a place to be holy, as a place to get close to God and as a place to then contend with, uh, with, with the devil and, and demons. Because of course, Every year we hear uh, the, the, the account of the temptation of Jesus, uh, where Jesus is full of the Holy Spirit after his baptism, but he's led by the Spirit into the wilderness for 40 days, into the desert, uh, tempted by the devil. He eats nothing during those days, and so when they ended, he was hungry. And so then the devil says to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. And Jesus answered him, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone. And the devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time and said to him, to you I will give all this authority and their glory, for it has been delivered to me, and I give it to whom I will. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered him, and it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. And the devil took Jesus to Jerusalem, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to guard you. And on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him, It is said, You will, shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. Uh, again, so the, the desert is a place of where you retreat from the world. It's a place where there you can get closer to God. It's where or, and prepare to for the next mission. Um, and it's also a place where you contend with the devil and his demons. And there's some uh, fantastical stories about Anthony dealing with demons too. Uh, we're also reminded that you know that this idea of holiness and separation um, comes sometimes with a cost, uh, family, family-wise, relationally. Uh, Jesus says, "I do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father." and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. And we'll see, um, you know, obviously, and Anthony, like we said, came from a wealthy family, sold all he had to go live in the desert, and of course this makes his family upset. Uh, we'll see some of the other people we look at, too. There's uh, fam different family situations, especially for women uh, who want to become nun, you know, what, you know, nuns, but who want to live in, live in a monastic community uh, when they're so expected to just become wives and mothers. Um, and so there's uh, challenges there. 
too. Um, we're also then uh, reminded again that the desert is a place of training, um, uh, and this is where some of these ascetics, uh, those who kind of renounce everything, are doing it, and they see themselves kind of like athletes, um, which Paul uses here in 1 Corinthians. So do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run it so you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. Um, so again, the, this idea of setting yourself apart, uh, going away and depriving yourself of things so that you can train yourself, you can focus more on connecting to God and getting closer to God through prayer uh, is, is a, was a part of these, these monastics, uh, was a part of the, these people who were trying to come, become more holy. Um, so again, these, these ascetic, especially, uh, you know, comes from the Greek word for training. Monks were kind of seen like athletes who had strange eating habits and withdrew from society to train to be better Christians. Um, so again, uh, Anthony has um, is seen like that somewhat. Again, he, tra he, he goes out in the desert a few different places uh, over time. Um, and throughout his life, sometimes he's surrounded by, um, he goes out in the desert to, to live alone, um, couple times he's in some abandoned fortresses and things um, where there's at least a you know steady water supply and things um, but people keep hearing about him and want to learn from him and come out and follow him and sometimes you can tell he's just annoyed that he wants to just be alone and and train himself but other times he relents and trains with other people and they live so they they, they all live alone but kind of close ish to each other all right, the next monastic monk weird, uh, we're going through is probably kind of one of the weirdest ideas for what we, uh, from what we'd see. Uh, and this is uh, Simeon Stiletus, uh, lives from 390 to 459, so a little later than Anthony. Uh, he lives on a column, is how he lives out his holy life, his life set apart. Um, starts on one that's about three meters high. Um, by the end of his life, he's on one that's about 18 meters or about 50 feet high. Uh, so the platform, and the platform's kind of like a um, a square meter thing. It's got a, a rim on it and stuff. But and so he is in um, he's in Syria, um, uh, about 19 miles northwest of Aleppo. Here we go. See, uh, of course. Arabic name now, Kalat Simon, um, Simeon. So he's, he's in the northwest corner of Syria, uh, is is where he is. Uh, you know the the place was still in existence. Uh, the Russians damaged it during the the Syrian war in um, they damaged it in 2016. Um, and again, so part of so he lives up on this column, which is. Um, he discovers he, he thinks is a, is a way for him to be be separate and obviously you know no one else can can reach him he tends to have a bucket so he can people can send him supplies and and that kind of thing um, but he lives up there up there and prays and um, and then uh, and this was a way um, was a popular way for some of these holy people to live uh, during this time uh, the problem is, of course, that this works well in Syria, where um, where it's warmer. Um, there's an account of uh, one one guy who's inspired by this, and then travels to France and tries to do it, and doesn't uh, gives up during the first winter. Uh, it's one thing to be up on top of a pillar in the heat. You know, I mean, there, there's there's ways to give yourself shade and, and ways for a breeze and things, um, but to be up on the pillar during during winter uh, is a whole other thing entirely. Um, so that didn't work. Um, but that's why there's different monastic groups and different ways of <laughs> how you set how you set yourself apart from the world uh, in different parts of the world. Uh, so yeah, uh, the next guy we look at is uh, Benedict of Nursia. So. Uh, he's again about a, about a century, yep, century later than uh, than Simeon, um, and he's we kind of considered the founder of Western monasticism. So again, we were dealing with people in Egypt and in uh, Syria, um, but then Benedict is in uh, Italy, 
Um, and he ends up uh, founding a bunch of different monasteries, but his, his most famous thing then is he uh, writes uh, his, his rule um, that's published in 516 AD, and it gives, gives guidelines for how, how a group of monks should live together, um, which also is, is, is different than, uh, than either Anthony or, or Simeon were dealing with, because um, they were trying to be alone um, and, and, and live alone, separate from, from the world and also and separate from other people. Um, but you also, again, had groups of people in the, in the East as well, as well as the West, but um, you know, people trying to live, live out this, this holy calling together. And so Benedict, but of course, once you get different people together, there's always possibility of conflict. Um, and so Benedict writes this rule that helps, gives them guidelines for how, how they're to live together. Uh, and it's summarized by peace and the traditional uh, aura at labora, uh, pray and work. And th those are kind of the overarching guidelines for how they're to live out their communal life. Um, again, and this is kind of what we, when we think of monks, these are the following guidelines. These are kind of who we'd uh, think of. So again, vows of poverty, um, so they're not supposed to be rich. Um, chastity, so they're, they're supposed to um, remain single. Um, not sexually active, and obedience, um, and so they're supposed to obey the abbot above them, um, and so and and so the, these are the those are the, the three three big three big guidelines. Two also stress communal living. So again, living with other people, uh, physical labor. Um, so they're not just so they're living out holy lives, but they're not just sitting around doing nothing, um, but they're doing. Um, but they're 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 working, and so they everyone has different jobs in the monastery uh, in order to keep things running. Uh, have common meals; they have, have their have their meal time together, uh, and then avoid unnecessary conversation. So various groups deal with this in uh, in different ways. Um, you see. Um, there we go. Yep, and there's um, uh, different people deal with, different groups dealt with this in, in different ways. Uh, some were, were totally silent, some let you talk at meal times, but you're silent other times. Some, depending on the season of the year, varied how much you can talk, some of that sort of thing. Um, and so, but as Bene Benedict drew these up, uh, he said that in drawing up these regulations, we hope to set down nothing harsh, nothing burdensome. Um, the good of all concerned, however, uh, may prompt us to a little strictness in order to amend faults and to safeguard love. So again, the, the rules are not supposed to be that hard, but they're uh, or strict. But sometimes strictness is needed in order to keep keep the community together. Uh, it varied how well uh, that worked. Um, that you um, there were some people in. Um, um, Benedict had actually got, um, as he, as even as he he chased, uh, founded these different groups, um, he still had some some challenges of um, dealing with community, and you know he, he he thought he was in charge. Not everyone liked listening to him. Again, he's in Nursia, um, and his but his most famous uh, monastery that he founds is in Monte Cassino. Uh, kind of halfway between Rome and Naples, um, and of course that's also famous for um, for being the site of a uh, being the site of a World War II battle, uh, as the Allies are are uh, coming up through Italy. All right, uh, next one we deal with is um, this wonderful woman, uh, Saint uh, Radagunda. I'm probably butchering that pronunciation, um, but she's a Thuringian princess, so from kind of uh, from uh, what modern-day Germany, uh, forced to marry a Merovingian king in modern-day France, eventually leaves her husband to become a nun and founds a monastery in Poitiers, France. And I butchered that too because I don't speak French. Uh, but so her piety and continence were such that her husband complained of having a nun rather than a wife or a queen. Uh, but despite her rank, again she's in nobility. Uh, she displayed great humility, tending the sick and the poor. Uh, so she, again, she's from Thuringia in modern-day Germany. And then she um, ends up being in France. 
Um, and again, this, we kind of see here this uh, this this challenge um, that women faced uh, in in living out their uh, monastic uh, life. She wants to set up, be set apart. She wants to go uh, live live a holy life, but uh, her family's demands and her husband are that she's married, uh, you know, arranged marriage, married off to this the Thuringian king, and then once she's married, well, she's supposed to fulfill her marital duties. Um, and even if she does not want to do these things. Um, and so she wants to, and, and so eventually she's able to uh, go off and be a nun. Um, but the, that that's, you, we can see too, you know, some of these monks we're looking at, you know, come from wealthy families, which they renounce the wealth, but coming from those wealthy families gives them a little more uh, freedom of movement, um, freedom to choose things than others. Um, but a different, but women had had different challenges in that way. But there were still certainly um, some that were doing this. Uh, yeah. All right. And then our last one we're going to look at today is uh, Columba, Saint Columba, who was born in 521 in. Ireland, uh, and then, but he's most famous then for founding the uh, a monastery in Iona, which on uh, the island of Iona, which is off the coast of Scotland. Uh, and he did that in 563 A.D. Um, and so here we get him in a different picture. This is him uh, ministering to the uh, to the Picts. You kind of see you know, him and some monks, and then you get some, you know. Um, so pick Scots, all those different kinds of groups. You know, we think of as you know, uh, Braveheart or uh, Viking kind of groups. Uh, so Iona, the island he's on, becomes the base of evangelism for pick Scots and other groups. Um, so again, he's from Ireland, um, but he lives. He eventually flees to Ireland. Um, we see at least uh, part of it uh, that he's he's doing this in a in a positive way because he wants to reach the Scots. Um, but we also see it's in a neg negative way. There was uh, some political ra wrangling going on that he got involved with, um, and there was a battle and people were killed. And uh, he got, depending on which source you look at, he he gets some blame for it, and that's part of why he flees to this island. Um, so he's not going to be around anyone that's going to do that anyway. Uh, I, the 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 community in on Iona still exists. Um, and they still publish uh, things. Um, they're, um, there's, uh, we have we have a hymn from uh, Columba in our in our hymnal that we'll we'll close with. I don't think we have um, have anything in our hymnal uh, from Iona. It tends to be kind of like the Tuesday stuff we have in the in the hymnal, kind of you know simple, repetitive, reflective uh, songs. Um, well, of course, today is in France and the Iona's in Scotland, so, uh, so you've got a little more Celtic lilt uh, to some of those things than you do in uh, in these other things. But let's see, it was uh, John Bell, no, four thirty-two. Uh, though, if we if we look at uh, if you look at him, four thirty-two. I think no. Oh, there we go. So we, we do we do have, have have won him kind of from the Iona community, um, but this is the the uh, Columbus Day was one of uh, uh, of just uh, recently, and so this is what they posted on their Facebook page. I figured I'd share it. So um, so now may kindly Columba guide you to be an isle in the sea, to be a hill on the shore, to be a star in the night, to be a staff for the week. May God, who is present in sunrise and nightfall, and in the crossing of the sea, guide your feet as you go. May God, who is with you when you sit and when you stand, encompass you with love and lead you by the hand. May God, who knows your path and the places where you rest, be with you in your waiting, be your good news for sharing, and lead you in the way that is everlasting. Amen. All right, and then one of the other things we see uh, with monasticism, and, and seems to be an Irish monasticism, that this idea is kind of codified or clarified a little more, uh, is that, again, part of what's going on is uh, these people want to live wholly separate lives because it's hard to live a regular, uh, they're finding it harder, hard to live a holy life 
in what's supposed to be a Christian society, where Christianity, again, is at least tolerated, if not the state religion. And then they also don't have that chance for martyrdom. Um, you know, we dealt with, you know, what happens, what do you do with people who, when persecution comes up, uh, renounce their faith or, you know, or, you know, hide their faith and then try and come back once the persecution lifts. But you also have people who kind of are looking, looking forward to that persecution, looking forward to that way to prove their faith that way. Um, and so that's some of these people who are attracted to these separate holy lives too. Um, but the Irish then, you know, once you get to the point of you're not having the, the opportunity for martyrdom anymore because there's not as much persecution, um, to divide things this way. Um, so white martyrdom consists in a man abandoning everything he loves for God's sake. So that's kind of this monastic life. Uh, green martyrdom means that then by fasting and labor, he frees himself from his e evil desires or suffers toil in penance and repentance. So this is kind of the, especially the ascetic kind of monasticism uh, where you're not just, you've not just abandoned things, given up some things in society, but you're also um, working to get closer to God or working to make up for what you've done in the past. And then, But then red, red martyrdom is the, you know, what we think of martyrdom, uh, endurance of a cross or death for Christ's sake, for suffering, uh, for being a Christian. Um, and again, this is looking at some of the early, earliest parts of monasticism, but monastics continue to influence the church uh, to the present day. Um, so, of course, here around here we know that uh, Luther was an Augustinian monk. Um, so different monastic orders pop up at different times throughout uh, church history as they, they're they trying to react again, not only to forces and cultural trends in the greater culture, but also trends within the church uh, that they're reacting to two different things. Um, and so, but Luther, of course, even though he, he, he becomes a monk because he's trying to get closer to God, because he's... Uh, you know, I mean, the, the, of course, we hear the story of him calling out to St. Anne uh, when he's caught in a thunderstorm. Um, and he wants, he's tortured by this idea of a, of a vengeful God and then wants to, and so wants to make sure that he is, um, gets close to God. Uh, and so he thinks being a monk is the best way to do it. Uh, but then he ends up, uh, after the Reformation, as, as he, uh, his, his understanding changes, uh, ends up renouncing monasticism at all, but he thinks this idea that monks and nuns, those who are separate from the world, are better than people who are living out their Christian life in the world isn't true, that everyone has a calling from God, uh, and those who live that out in the world are just as good, if not uh, as those outside. Uh, and so instead, again, focuses on people living out their callings in the places God placed them in, citizens, family members, etc. And so, so of course, as Lutherans, we tend we tend to have a negative view of monasticism, um, even though there are some some Lutheran uh, monastic communities. Um, but there's um, but we tend to think tend tend to again like Lut because of Luther's uh, experience, uh, not like it. Also, of course, I mentioned St. Benedict is the founder of Western monasticism. Uh, one book idea that's been in the news the last decade or so uh, is a book, a guy named Ron Dreyer, who among uh, is uh, advocating for American Christians to follow a Benedict option, uh, which described Scott as broadly attempt to inspire uh, churches and small old Orthodox Christian believers who locate themselves in the great tradition to grow in holiness in a post-Christian society. So the idea that as our society is getting, despite being in what people, some people consider a Christian nation, uh, is our culture, where as our culture gets more, further and further away from what we think of as a, as a, as a Christian society um, in a variety of ways, um, that Christians should, instead of just living in the culture and being influenced by the culture, should follow this Benedict option and go live in community somewhere else um, you know, this isn't everyone becoming monks, it's kind of, you know, he's got all sorts of different ideas and he's, he's modified it over the, over the years, um, but kind of this idea of Christians living together, um, 
you know, go, families working together, training, you know, kids going to school together, uh, but all kind of separate from the from the further culture. And we see that in some, uh, you know, again, there's some some good good points to that idea and, and some bad points because we see some some very negative uh, effects from some of these isolated religious communities. Uh, but then they're also, as separate from the world, you know, we can make sure that what they're learning and things. So, uh, again, this idea of what does it mean to be holy um, and how do we live out our holy lives and how can we be set apart uh, from society continue to be ideas that we, we look at today. Um, so we're going to end, though, I want to close by, we do have a hymn written by Columba of Ireland uh, in our hymnal. Um, and it's hymn 539, Christ is the world's redeemer. Christ is the world's redeemer, the lover of the pure, the font of heavenly wisdom, our trust and hope secure. The armor of his soldiers, the Lord of earth and sky, our health while we are living, our life when we shall die. Christ has our hosts surrounded with cloud of, clouds of martyrs bright, who wave at their palms in triumph and fire us for the fight. Then Christ the cross ascended to save the world undone, and suffering for the sinful, our full, full redemption won. Down through the realm of darkness he strode in victory, and at the hour appointed he rose triumphantly. And now to heaven ascended he sits upon the throne, whence he had ne'er departed his fathers and his own. Glory to God the Father, the unbegotten one. All honor be to Jesus, his sole begotten Son. And to the Holy Spirit, the perfect Trinity, let all the worlds give answer. Amen. So let it be. Thank you for listening. <laughs>